This is an interview with uh, Jerome Connolly. It is in, at the Days Inn, Hicksville, New York, uh, the 16th of July, 2003, approximately 12.30 p.m. The interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Well, it's Jerome Edward Connolly. And my date of birth is December 6th, 1924. Okay, and your place of birth, please? In Manhattan. All right. Um, what was your educational background prior to entering military service? I finished one year, freshman year at Fordham University. Okay. And um, <clears throat> where were you, and what do you recall about your feelings when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Well... I was, as so many people were doing, I think, I think it was a Sunday, if I'm not yes. mistaken. We were taking the Sunday drive with the one guy and with the one family in the neighborhood who had a car. And when we heard that, uh, that Pearl Harbor had been attacked, we didn't even know where Pearl Harbor was, let alone anything about it. Mm -hmm. And so it didn't seep into us until we got back. And then... Uh, the uh, various radio programs had all of the information or the news about it, and that's when we became aware of it. Okay, did you uh, enlist or were you drafted? No, I was, uh, I was drafted. Uh, that's a story in itself. My father was in the 2nd Infantry Division, World War I, 12th Field Artillery. I used to hear all kinds of stories about the war, and he told me that I should... If it ever came to it, I should join the Navy because you got clean sheets, warm food, the whole bit, which I thought was a pretty good idea. So I went down to Church Street, which is in Manhattan, when after when it became obvious that that I was we, at first it was 21 years, mm -hmm. then it became 18, and I was 17, but I was going to be 18 pretty quickly, so it became obvious. So I went down there and I passed everything with flying colors, except ironically, I couldn't pass the colorblind test, which happened to be a Japanese test. Circles, dots, and you gotta, uh -huh. and you gotta put the thing in. So uh, I just had to abandon uh, getting in the Navy because they had this program where they were going. It's called V12. Uh -huh. They were going to either send you to college and then the ensign school and then you'd get a commission and that's what happened to my buddies and they had pretty good wars as a consequence in my case the army did come out with a program similar and it was in the spring and everybody could take an exam and tell which place they wanted to go which one they wanted to go if they qualified so i naturally put the army because there was no sense doing it with the navy and ultimately, I got into the program, and I went to Illinois U to take tests, and I went to Wisconsin University for a semester, and then they needed guys in the infantry, so they lopped the whole program off and shipped us away. And ironically, what I used to tell the guys in the foxhole, that you never knew that colorblindness could have been the death of you. <laughs> Because if I hadn't been colorblind, I'd have had just as good a time as my buddies that went in the Navy program. And that's the story on that. <clears throat> Where did you go for your basic training? I went uh, down, I went, you know, they just did it haphazardly. Mm -hmm. And I went down to uh, Camp Pickett, Virginia, which was a, a medical uh, basic training program. In other words, you did, all the physical stuff was infantry oriented, but... Instead of fooling around with guns, they taught you rudimentary first aid. That's mm -hmm. really what it was. Now, did you volunteer for that, or did you take a test and they pick you? Or I no, I volunteered to get into the to the A12 program right. and stuff like that. But no, I didn't take mm -hmm. uh, I, my assignment into the medics. Just happened. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, what did you get? Any, what kind of specific training did you get? Well, over there I got, uh, as I said, a high-grade uh, first aid course, mm -hmm. and uh, the rest of the stuff was close order drill and hikes and all the rest. So other than the uh, 
just having the medical uh, instead of the uh, military type, uh, the one thing, uh, everything else is just about like any other, anybody else's basic. Mm -hmm. Where did you go after Camp Pickett? Well, I got appendicitis and I was sent uh, home and I got a furlough and then I went out to Camp Grant in Illinois. Up to that point, I had the letter saying that I qualified for the Army program, but nobody was giving me any, nobody was paying any attention to me. But when I got to Camp Grant, then uh, some guy said, hey kid, <laughs> you're supposed to be an ASTP, which is what the uh, wording was, the, the letters. And uh, he helped me, and the next thing you know, I was on my way into ASTP. Okay, um, so uh, where did you go f for that? Camp Grant, Illinois. Okay. Oh, then, then I went to Illinois U to take tests. Okay. And then from Illinois U, I went to Wisconsin U and had a semester. Mm -hmm. And during that time, they had 100,000 soldiers in ASTP, all probably between 18 and 21, or close to it. And they just looked. They, they were they were going. They needed men for the uh, to fill in on basically the infantry divisions. So the next thing you know, I was out in Camp White in Medford, Oregon, with the 96th Infantry, and my a couple of my buddies from Wisconsin ended up at the same place, but they were spread around, and uh, we were not a constituency, so there was nobody nobody was crying about us getting assigned to the infantry. Okay, so were, you were assigned to the infantry as a, a, well, a corpsman, or that's what happened. Mm -hmm. When I got out to the 96th Infantry Division, I was assigned as a corpsman in the in the battalion medical detachment, and then from there I got assigned from that to a heavy weapons machine gun platoon, and that's where I stayed until like till the end of the war. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was yeah, there you know there's. The, the Navy gets more publicity on that because they had flags of our father and, you know, that, that one of the guys was a corpsman. Mm -hmm. But that's essentially what I did. And and I had a platoon to take care of. But actually what would happen is that uh, because we were in the machine guns, we would follow the riflemen uh, when they were making a, uh, a shot at some pill or whatever the heck else it would be. And we would fire behind them, but we were close enough to them that when guys got hit, the deal was you'd hear that cry, medic, medic, <laughs> and the guys would all look around, and if I happened to be there, they'd all look around at me, and I'd had to go out, and whoever it was that was mm -hmm. wounded and take care of them. It wasn't fun, let's put it that way. Okay, um, now we're, what theater did you go to? We went to the Pacific. Pacific, okay. How did you, uh, where did you go from Oregon? We went from White, from Camp White in Oregon down to uh, Camp Callan and uh, places like that down in Southern California. Made a couple of uh, uh, practice landings on San Clemente Island and then we all got back from that stuff and then they gave us what we call the Port of Embarkation furlough, POE. And when we came back, and after a very short time, we were there, by the way, when that thing blew up where the black Navy guys are oh. suing the Army. Mm -hmm. We were on the Sacramento River going down to our place when, when that happened. And uh, But anyway, from there, we went, uh, we got on the ship and we went to Hawaii trained some more, attacked Maui, <laughs> and then we got on the ship and off we were to the Philippines. Okay, um, now were you, uh, you were on the invasion of the Philippines then? I was in the first wave. Mm -hmm. Okay, could you tell us about that? Uh? Well, you know, it's a little, uh, believe it or not, and I, I mentioned it in my book, Leyte to Us, was like a Boy Scout trip. Uh, and when we got on the island, we came into the Amtraks, 
what a lot of people don't realize is that you only see, as an infantry guy, 50 yards this way and 50 yards that, mm -hmm. and they could be just going crazy with each other, but you wouldn't you wouldn't know about it. So I'd say that our our invasion of Leyte, the outfit that I was in, was quite benign. I could hear bullets and and you'd see some uh, you know uh, shell shell uh, dirt flying around and stuff like that. But it actually wasn't like let's say Private Ryan, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of people don't understand that. And it's just as well it isn't. Because if you, were, if everybody saw everything was going on, they never would have been able to get us to move another step. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's that was Phil the Philippine one. We had to get out all the, all the. We were on these uh, landing craft tanks, and they're little, small tanks. And if the motor goes, the tank sinks. Or in in our case, what happened as we moved inland, we all got caught in the morass of mud, which is basically what the Philippines uh, look like mm -hmm. and uh, so from there on in we were on our we had to move by our feet and keep going. Now this is where you first started treating your first wounded? <clears throat> yep, yep. What uh, kind of treatment did you give to the wounded? Well, uh, let, you know, it varied depending mm -hmm. on, uh, on uh, what you had to do uh, because you know, when I, I simplified it, but they did teach us enough to to maybe do different things. Well, uh, the first wound that I had, a guy got hit in the uh, thigh, and what you do there is that you would uh, pour uh, sulfur on it, mm -hmm. and you'd give him a shot of morphine to make sure that he was calmed down. And that's ironic, because in those days, they took great. They took great measures to make sure that you couldn't get into the drink, drinking, and so that all the medical alcohol that was distributed had tincture of green soap in it, so that we didn't you go to work on that. But in the meantime, we were given these syringes of morphine. Nobody took inventories on it. Nobody knew how many we had. Nobody knew anything. But morphine and then the culture in that day, we never thought of mm -hmm. shooting ourselves up. Uh, and t like today, I'm sure every morphine syringe is counted and whatever have you. Uh, but that was the basic thing. Mm -hmm. Get the sulfur on them. Give them a morphine shot. Make sure his feet were over his head. I mean, you know, a higher than his head because otherwise they'd go into shock. And then there were other wounds that uh, that I that I had to take. I could uh, I fixed oh uh, guys that had uh, their uh, guts shot out. Uh, uh, you had to always put wet compresses on it. That was the thing that you did when that happened. I had to take care of some guys with carotid artery hits, and they had to know the pressure points that you had to do. But uh, I uh, like to tell this one because it's so odd that if I wasn't right there, uh, I'd have a hard time believing it myself. But uh, we were all on Okinawa, and we were going to get relieved. And we were sitting in our foxhole, above the foxhole, with our backs to where the front line was supposed to be. But Okinawa was a series of caves almost, and the Japs would not give up and they'd hide in the caves and all of a sudden a shot was fired out where the three or four of us were sitting in the cave. I mean in the, in our foxhole, but just above it. And uh, the guy next to me, uh, Howard Stock, he's a curmudgeon from Iowa and he's still going strong and still smoking his cigarettes and he's still alive. But he went down and I couldn't figure out where he'd gotten hit. So I ripped off his his uh, combat jacket and I saw a little slight uh, scratch down his throat. And then as I went down further, there was a protruding uh, piece of something in him that was sticking out 
right here. But what had happened to him was that the bullet went into his mouth, broke his jaw, went down his throat, pierced his, pierced his uh, lung, and then lodged in the side there. And I mean, and he lived. <laughs> and I, the only thing I can liken it to is when you throw a piece of uh, a rock in, in, a, in a pond of water and it goes mm -hmm. different ways. That's the only thing I can think of. Uh, that's, if he had been, his, if he had been talking with his mouth open, his, it, just, it would have just blown his head off. But somehow it, it went down through his mouth and, and he lived. And it's a hard one to believe, but uh, I'd say that was the uh, most uh, uh, onerous and interesting, if you want to call it interesting, wound that I ever, I ever had. I mean, I've, I've seen others. The guy, when you get a shot in the in the lungs, you got to make sure, no matter how dirty or whatever it is, is to is to cover it so that they can't air can't get into it. Uh, you got. There were also we had a we had a situation in an Okinawa where uh, we were all getting up in the morning from our foxholes. We were on this big hill called uh, Conical Hill. It was on the uh, east side of Okinawa, and uh, we the, this fellow that was not a PhD was our machine gunner, and he said, "I see Japs over there." So we just all stayed in our hole and said, "Go ahead, hit him." So he started firing at them, and within a few minutes, the officers from down the bottom of the hill were running up. We were shooting at our own men. Well, that wasn't really our fault, but that, that's what happened. So here we are, and one of the fellows, I can remember his name, Victor Rones, he was with us, and he got out of the, of the hole with another guy from F Company. I always remember the rifleman. And the two of them looked and tried to sight where they had had uh, been shooting at when all of a sudden out popped another crack and it was a bullet and the both of them went down and what had happened the guy on F Company had it go through past his, his insides here in his belly or whatever you want to call it and then the bullet went through and hit the other guy our guy just uh, by the uh, by his heart and I, I looked, and you could just see the little spurts coming out, and, and he was he was a goner. So, ironically, the guy that got first hit lived, and the guy that was the second one died. Hmm. And uh, you know, you had you, the the one the one I was thinking before it was intestines. The guy's intestines were all out, and that's what I had to do. I had to do with him. But most of the wounds were basically uh, rifle wound, wounds. Uh, with a few shell wounds, and uh, but you kept busy. Mm -hmm. We had uh, an infantry uh, battalion has about eight to nine hundred men, and uh, on Okinawa, uh, our casualty rate was two hundred killed just in the battalion out of the eight to nine hundred, and the balance were all uh, wounded. That doesn't mean that they were. Mm -hmm. because the replacements and things like that, but on just a s set f number of figures, they were, uh, that's that's the casualty rate. So when you're a medic, you certainly get a lot of work to, to do just to, uh, uh, well, and, and there's, there's always some things about it. We were, we were going over uh, a hill and somehow we had gotten separated the machine guns. It would be two heavy weapons machine guns in each platoon. So there was a there was a space of about 70, 80 yards between us and the rest of our guys and all of a sudden from the other end the cry went out for a medic. And so what did I, I just had a look and I estimated how far I had to run and I just got my stuff and I ran like I never ran and the guys when I got over there the guys had known that I'd been on a, a track man and they said gee now we really believe you were a track man <laughs> because I, I guess I never ran faster than I did for that uh, that amount but the, 
life would just keep going on this way. As a matter of fact, uh, I'm just remembering just itsy bitsies of it, but you, you forget it. And uh, it doesn't stay with your memory, thank God. Otherwise, you'd be having nightmares every night. Now, did you have any uh, identification on you, like a, a cross on your helmet or on your sleeve that very, you were a medic? Very, very interesting. In the Pacific, you did not have crosses of any type. And the reason being that it, that would have only made you a bigger target. Mm -hmm. Because they would have been... Absolute. Matter of fact, they, they literally almost didn't have any respect. To, and I get this from other books that I read, mm -hmm. for people that that would kowtow to having medical, so they just looked and said a bunch of sissies or whatever goes through their crazy minds, and I never could figure them out, but uh, uh, they would have just shot you like, you know, so we, I carried a carbine and I carried grenades. And mm -hmm. In essence, we aid men were, were infantry men, which were the first aid kit. Yeah. The bad part of the difference was is that the the rifle guys and everything didn't have to go go out unless they were you know ordered to go out. And in my case, I had to go out because psychologically these guys had all looked at the medic mm -hmm. when the guy was yelling. And if you didn't go out, you lost all the respect of the guys. Mm -hmm. So you naturally went out every time the call came. And uh, oh, I think another thing that. Uh, you'd be interested in is Okinawa was one of the first places where they got a tremendous number of combat fatigue guys because the Japs had a more they had a, many more heavy weapon type of things Shelley you know whatever 155 meter sh uh, cannons and or whatever and so the uh, the action got more like Maybe the old World War One days, and where you had a lot of, a lot of stuff coming around you, and that, that affected uh, people. I, I ran into a guy. See, you'd know all the medics because you were attached together when, in, in uh, uh, when you were stateside, and so even though you're in combat, even though they were in different companies and everything, and they literally uh, a different battalion could be. You'd know them, and I got up to this one place where we, it was a hill, and the um, the uh, tanks were there. We had tanks, and Okinawa was one of the first places where they had really used tanks, and we hated to see them because as soon as the tanks came, uh, the Japs had started firing, and you you were in a place. But anyway, I went. I happened to be over there with him, and and uh, I don't know how I got involved, but we were trying to organize having guys get carried back. And uh, all of a sudden I saw this guy, Dan Purvis, who was a uh, medic, same as myself, but he was with a rifle platoon. And all of a sudden, he told me before this happened, he said, you know, Jerry, he said, I did something I never thought I'd have to do in my life. He said, I cut a guy's arm off. Now the guy had got it shred, you know, mm -hmm. shriveled, no, it had to be done. And, you know, what could you say when he said that? But then just a little bit later, I looked and there he was laying on the ground, shaking convulsively. And we put ponchos over him to kind of keep him warm, but he just was a goner in that way. So we finally got him in a, in a uh, stretcher, took him back. I never heard or saw, I've often wondered whatever happened to him, but he was the worst case that I had ever seen. Now, what were you, were you given any instructions on how to treat the combat fatigue, or uh, wasn't recognized at the time? Or? Oh, well, uh, there was no George Patton mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. Uh, the guys, uh, the, when the guys got the fatigue, got it, and really, it would usually be pretty bad. They wouldn't really be able to function, and, uh, and so... The only thing you did is you got them back as quick as possible, mm -hmm. and uh, with most of these guys, they couldn't be faking it. To be, I mean, you knew they weren't faking it, and so we uh, we never 
we just wanted the guys to do their jobs and nobody was looking for a hero and so that if a guy you know became nervous and shaky and whatever have you we'd give him uh, the attitude would be uh, supportive as long as we knew he wasn't trying to screw off or, and leave us mm -hmm. there uh, that was the way we uh, faced it but it's a frightening it's, a, it's not a frightening thing it's a well, yeah, you get frightened because you can just think about that you could be there. But when you see these guys go that way, it's very demoralizing. Very. And as I say, they, from what I read, Okinawa had the most of that in, in the Pacific. Now, you uh, received a Purple Heart. Where did you, uh, what happened? <laughs> yeah, I got the Purple Heart. Uh, I got what they call a five-pointer. You know, during the war, World II, if you had like a, got a bronze star, you got five extra points. If you got a silver star, you maybe had ten extra points. If you got a purple heart, you, so we were all conscious of that because we wanted to build up our points because there was going to be a time when they're going to take you home, and points were the uh, how quick you got home. Mm -hmm. The points were the mm -hmm. thing that determined it. Well, I was sitting outside a, I was sitting outside a hole. I don't know where, and all of a sudden, a piece of shrapnel came down and tore off my uh, combat jacket and gave me a good scrape on my back of my right shoulder, you know, clavicle or whatever they call it. So I went back to the aid station and uh, to find out how good or bad it was and to get a jacket because I didn't have a jacket. Well, they dressed the, the uh, what was not a terrible wound, but it was a wound and they dressed it and I got five points. Hmm. Now I noticed you said you received two brand stars. Where did you receive those? I uh, got uh, one on Leyte and one on Okinawa. The one on Okinawa was uh, pretty, pretty interesting. There were three guys that got hit, and I had to. Uh, I was the guy that had to go out. I was the guy around. And while I was while I was taking care of them, two of them got hit again with shrapnel. One badly, and one not badly. But uh, <laughs> I said, "Geez, what's good?" I mean, you know. Give me a break! <laughs> Here I am trying to, and two they got wounded twice, and never, but we got rid of you know we got them out and all, and that was the, that was the main thing, as a, as a, an aid guy or as a medic in the infantry, the whole trick was to get the guys back as quick as you could, and that was the saving thing. It was very, very important, you know, otherwise the guys lay around and uh, it's no good. Okay. Um, how long were you on Okinawa? The whole time, from April 1st until they declared the, they declared the island, uh, you know, secure at the end of uh, June. So it was a good three months. And ironically, uh, the first thing that happened, we, we had a division, assistant division commander named Claudius Easley. And he was a, a renowned sharpshooter in the pre-World War II days. Uh, you know, he went to contests and so, that's why we're called the Dead Eyes, because he determined that every guy in that outfit were going to have, uh, you know, shops, mm -hmm. except the medics, of course. I mean, it, it, we had the guns, but they didn't want anybody to kind of delve into that part of it. Well, he got killed literally two or three days before the, uh, the island was secured. The guy that was heading the whole tent, the whole tenth army. We were under the tenth army, tenth army, and then twenty fourth corps, or whatever, and then, and the different divisions. The guy that was the head of the whole tenth army was a guy named uh, Oliver Buckner, Jr. 
his father had been a Confederate general and, uh, and ha had surrendered to Grant at Donaldson and, uh, and Fort Henry. And this is the and he got killed another day or so just mm -hmm. before it was all over. So they so two of the top uh, brass. It was such, such an ironic thing to have it happen, you know. After it's almost it's all over, really. Mm -hmm. And these two guys. Uh, Were you there for the typhoon? Uh, yeah, I was, but I wasn't with the ninety sixth anymore. Mm -hmm. When the typhoon came. Uh, I was working for the Red Cross as a listed man helper and uh, making some extra money and so I was with them but I was with I was there when the typhoon hit in uh, I think it was October blew everything down <laughs> So you were on shore I was on shore mm -hmm. yeah How long were you assigned with the Red Cross Uh I was with them well it happened just around when the atom bomb was, uh, it was ironic. I had a good buddy of mine that was a roommate of mine at ASTP, and he was blind in one eye, but nobody would believe him. So they kept, he didn't get out of it anything. But he came down to visit me after the thing was all over in July, and uh, he said, you want to come on up? He, he said, I finally got, they finally know that I, they, I can't see. He said, and I got a job with the Red Cross. Why don't I come on up with me? Maybe I can get you a job. So I went up there, and they gave me a detached service. They allowed me to work for the Red Cross. With all the nonsense, when the bomb came and our outfit was being scheduled to go to the Philip back to the Philippines for, well, before the bomb, they were just going to go back into training again. Uh, they forgot all about me. And of course, after the bomb was down, and, uh, I just stayed on and worked for the Red Cross until I got sent home. Uh, when were you discharged? I was discharged, I, th I was just looking it over in that little book there that I wrote, uh, ch ch January 16th of, of 45, no, of 46. 46. What, um, do you recall ever seeing MacArthur? No. What, what were your feelings about MacArthur? At the time, my feelings, you know, he's a showboat, mm -hmm. and, you know, and dug out Doug. They, and, you know, the guys didn't think he had any courage. Uh, subsequently, reading about him, including, uh, uh, what was that one about? American Caesar, I think, mm -hmm. by... Uh, um, Manchester. Manchester. Uh, you got a different attitude. He was a very brave guy. I don't think I'd want to work for him because I think he was too arbitrary and and for snickety. But uh, I, I got after the war. I had a much better opinion. But during the war, the guys didn't have a good opinion of him. But then it was an ignorant opinion. So, what what was your uh, feelings? What were your feelings when you heard about the death of President Roosevelt? Do you recall that? Well, you're looking at even in those days, I was an arch conservative. So I didn't, I, you know, I wasn't going to go down somewhere and cry. But actually what it was with the guys, you know, we were in, as a matter of fact, when he got killed, I think we were either still on the lines or mm -hmm. going up again or whatever. And, and all we wanted to do was get home. So they didn't have any of the, mm -hmm. uh, or at least not to us fellas, we didn't even think about mm -hmm. things like that. How about the uh, dropping the atomic bombs? How did you feel about that? Oh, I felt my life. I felt my life was saved. Uh, the, uh, you know, when you just looked at the casualties that we had in Okinawa, and they they uh, projected way more. They projected 250 for the first invasion and a million for the second invasion. Uh, you know. It, it would have been a tough go, so uh, that the, guy, ever, the guys were just delighted. They didn't really realize the implications. They just, mm -hmm. you know, in those days, all we thought was that it was a hell of a big bomb. Mm -hmm. Nobody knew yeah. all of the things that it could do, but uh, the guys that I knew were all very happy about it. Mm -hmm. Did you ever make use of the GI Bill when you returned? Oh yes, yeah. That was how I got myself some extra money. 
I was back, I went up to the athletic department at school and I said, hey, I was getting all this for nothing and now the government's paying. Uh, so, they, so I said, how about giving me free room and board, which didn't come specifically mm -hmm. under the GI. And that's how it worked out. Yeah. Um, did you ever use the 5220 club? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Everybody did, yeah. That was in the, in the summertime, when you, were in, when you were not at school, you all ran up there. But they, the last year they made it real tough. They started to really check in on us. And as a matter of fact, I don't think I got it the last, mm -hmm. the last year I applied. But it was, it was uh, everybody knew about the 5220, and everybody, uh, everybody got it. Did you join any veterans organizations? Uh, not, not at the start. Uh, I, I uh, am a member of the Purple Heart Club that mm -hmm. I didn't realize existed, and when some, I never knew about it. Anyway. Mm -hmm. And I'm in that, and I, I rejoined the uh, American Legion because of social reasons in, in my town. You know, not that it was going to get anywhere, but you know, I, I'm friendly mm -hmm. with them. We're going to, and uh, then I went, I, I went and still go to my reunions. I started that about 15 years ago, and mostly have made every one of them since then. And uh, I'm going this, this. The end of the next week, I guess, uh, to Tulsa, Oklahoma. I've been all over the world doing this. Tulsa, uh, Lubbock, Texas, Reno, Nevada. They've been all over, except the east where it's too expensive mm -hmm. to hold them. It was all far away. But I got hooked. But now, sad, I'm going to this one, and then there are only going to be two more. Mm -hmm. one, uh, next year, it'll be out at Salt Lake City. And the following year, it's going to be in uh, Washington, D.C. And I'm sure the Washington, D.C. one is going to have a panoply of flags and, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, and our, our division is one of the only divisions that has a presidential citation. We got it for Okinawa. Now, whether I know there were, there were the, the powers to be that we run the division. You know, there's always some guys that are running something for nothing. And they really worked hard to get us recognized. So uh, I don't know whether we out out politic to some others or we just had the the quals. But, uh, but we got that. And uh, it's, it's it, it, there was uh, the last year when they announced this stuff. There was a lot of uh, tears. The guys just didn't want to and up with crazy ideas how they could keep us going. But you, can, you know, you've got to just look at it and say, hey, you know, you don't have uh, you don't have the membership anymore, which we don't, unfortunately. We started out in my platoon was reunion nights about with 15. And uh, I just was talking to a guy down in Florida who was going to meet me there. And we're going to be lucky if we have four or five guys. So you stayed in contact with some that you served? Yeah, I always was a, a letter writer and a guy, and I did stay in contact. Mm -hmm. and so that years later, uh, I had a job that I was able to start to call my own shots. And I, I, uh, wasn't, I went out to Chicago, and I ran into one of my sergeants there. And oh, I, I think I'll tell you why I never had, never got any uh, stripes. But anyway, I ran in one of my sergeants, and they were having it down in Peoria, Illinois. So I said, "Hey, gee. I had my wife with me. It was a Chicago trip." So down we went, and I met these fellows. I hadn't seen them in God knows when, but you know, they they were all good friends, even though you don't see them. They're, they're like if I lived, if they lived around the corner from me, I might never be friends with them. But because of the commonality of what we experienced, you got a real different feeling about guys. So I went to that one, and then I was hooked, and I've been, I've been going to each reunion since. But in answer, uh, not an answer, but to just give you the reason why, <laughs> and my sons killed me because all three of my sons were military guys, and were two were, well, you know, they all had, uh, they were all officers. But anyway. This guy, there was a guy in, a, in this platoon that I was assigned to. His name was Homer, Homer Bass. 
He was out from Oklahoma and Indian blood in him. He would wreck PXs when he got too much to drink. But he was a very brave, pretty good soldier. As a matter of fact, a doggone good one. So he ruled the platoon with an iron hand, and uh, he one day called them all out for close order drill just for practice. This was in on, uh, Hawaii. So I'm not attached, I'm not part of the platoon. I'm attached to them, but I have to report basically to the medical detachment. That's, that was where mm -hmm. our, uh, everything resided. So I told him, I'm not going to, I'm not even in this platoon. I'm not going to do this. If somebody gets hurt, call me. Well, I drove him crazy. And he was, he was really ticked off at me. But fast forward, we're on Okinawa. It's at nighttime. You never got out of your hole at night. Never, never. And uh, the uh, cry came down to me. That Homer Bass, that's the guy's name, got shot and got, got it kind of bad in the leg, and he needs a medic. <laughs> how, how ironic. So I, what I did is I got out of the hole slowly and gently, and then I started to just say, medic, don't shoot. I'll never forget. Medic, don't shoot. And I kept saying it as I made my way to his foxhole. I got there in safety, thank God. And I fixed up his leg the best I could. And the next morning, we couldn't do it at night, but we, we got him sent back. So he said to me, soldier to the end, you know, the T.O. was there, and if, if there wasn't an opening, you, you could be there for the rest of your life, and you'd never get promoted. In other mm -hmm. words, uh, as a medic, there'd be one T5, or corporal as they call, and then two PFCs, and that would be it. And if the T5 didn't get hit or killed, you never got promoted. So Bass said to me, Conley, I'm going to see that you get stripes. And that was the end of him. Well, believe it or not, we got called back when we were back for a, uh, a, a rest area thing. I got called to go up to the, med to the uh, de medical detachment, and they told me that Homer Bass had said that he wants me to get a stripe, but they can't give me one in my company. But they have openings and they and rifle companies, so <laughs> I, 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 there was no way that I was going to volunteer for a rifle company. So I just said, "Hey, I got my buddies. I know them there. Doesn't mean that much to me. Uh, I'll stay where I am." Well, we we're on this doggone hill, that conical peak that I told you about, the mm -hmm. one where the machine mm -hmm. guns and we were all there. We were uh, we were up on one hill and we saw. Our guy's getting the hell knocked out of him in the, air, the hill over the air, and that would have been the place that I would have been in if I had if I had said, "Yeah, I'll go and be a T5 or a corporal." So, I, in in a way, in a blank way, I I saved myself mm -hmm. because I do know that one of the medics that they had got killed. I did know that. Uh, so anyway, that was. Uh, how do you think um, your time in service changed or affected your life? Oh, uh, I, uh, I tell you what, I, I made a, <laughs> a sermon in, uh, in a Catholic church out in New Jersey. My son lives, one of my sons lives there, and they wanted to... Uh, they wanted, uh, uh, they had every Thanksgiving, they have some of the parishioners get up and tell why they're thankful for being there and mm -hmm. whatever house like this. And he said to my son, he said, gee, I'd love to have a, I just read uh, Tom Brokaw's book, I'd love to have a, a World War II veteran talk. So my son said, uh, I got just the guy for you. Because <laughs> the Connellys really have never seen a mic they don't like. And uh, so I gave this speech, and I'm not going to give it all, but, but anyone who has survived the, 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 this type of army experience feels that he has been given a second chance in the game of life. In my case, I wanted to excel 
and the important things, what were they? To be an honorable and just person, to be able to raise a wonderful family, to see my children grow up in the faith that I cherish, and to meet a wonderful wife who would share this family with me to modestly provide, and, and to modestly provide for them. So on this Thanksgiving Day, I wanted to thank everybody. I mean, I, 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 I have a superabundance to be grateful for, and as ridiculous as it sounds, war was a defining point in my life. So it made me a very religious guy. <laughs> if I wasn't, we copy before. that to put in your folder. Pardon me? Can we make a copy of that and I'll put it in your folder? Well, you can have this. Oh, oh, I bought it. Oh, I bought right. it. Thank I thought, you. I just thought you, you know, I didn't know whether you'd even be interested. Mm -hmm. in yes, this. thank you. But uh, anyway, it uh, it was quite an it was quite an experience uh, doing this sort of thing. I don't believe that people should clap in church, mm -hmm. and a lot of people do these days. Yes. And so when I finished, I got a pretty good hand, and I almost changed my opinion on whether <laughs> clapping in church should be allowed or not. Well, thank you very much for your interview. Yes, thank you. Well, I I kind of enjoyed it. My father had a an expression. He'd say, "Oh, people like to talk." So <laughs> I guess when you get one of us guys, it could be a run-on sentence. <laughs>